I'm Shahar Azani, and this is In the News, the ongoing issue of America's killing of Qasem Soleimani. Much has been talked and discussed in the last few days about Iran following the killing of Qasem Soleimani, the commander of the Al-Quds Force of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard and the architect of Iranian terror. Soleimani was responsible for many deaths from Syria to Yemen, from Lebanon to the torture and execution of up to 1,500 people inside Iran, according to Amnesty International, in the latest uprising only a few weeks ago. Thousands of people whose sole desire was fresh air and freedom. This pattern of Iranian behavior is nothing new. Iran has been a destabilizing actor in the Middle East and beyond for years, and all under the banner of exporting the revolution. To understand the regime's modus operandi, it is worthy to take a moment and take a step back from current affairs to be reminded of some history. First, we go back to 1983, where on October 23rd, 241, I repeat, 241 U.S. service personnel were killed by truck bomb at a marine compound in Beirut, Lebanon. At the same time the marine barracks was hit, a suicide bomber drove a pickup truck full of explosives and crashed into a building housing French peacekeeping paratroopers. Approximately 58 French soldiers were killed in that attack. This was the deadliest attack against the U.S. Marines since the battle over Iwo Jima in 1945. In 2003, a U.S. federal judge ruled that the terrorist group Hezbollah carried out the attack at the direction of the Iranian government. The ruling allows families of the victims to sue Iran, and indeed, in 2016, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the families of the 1983 bombing victims should be compensated by Iran using Iranian frozen funds in the U.S. But rest assured, the Iranians did not limit themselves to working only in the Middle East. At exactly 2.45 p.m. on March 17, 1992, time stopped in Buenos Aires, Argentina as a powerful bomb shattered the building of the Israeli embassy, taking the lives of 29 people and injuring hundreds more. Hezbollah, again, in Arabic, the party of God, claimed responsibility for the attack. In one moment, the embassy and the nearby church were literally wiped off the map. Among the dead were three Israeli embassy personnel, diplomats, shlichim, emissaries from Israel, six local embassy employees, and scores of innocent Argentinians, including elderly residents of a nearby nursing home and school children on a passing school bus. In May 1999, following a formal investigation, the Argentinian Supreme Court accused Hezbollah of the attack. In 2003, Israeli authorities and Israeli Mossad published their own investigation and showed that the highest levels of the Iranian regime were aware of Hezbollah's intention and indeed authorized Hezbollah to carry out the attack. And if that was not enough, two years later, on July 18th of 1994, two years after the decimation of the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires, one morning at 9 a.m., a huge explosion rocked the city. A second murderous attack against Israeli and Jewish targets in Argentina. This time, the attack was launched against the Amia Jewish Community Center, which was completely destroyed. Eighty-five people lost their lives in the blast, and more than 330 were injured in the bombing. This was the worst attack ever to take place in Argentina's history. The Argentinian investigative magistrate concluded that it was Iran who was responsible for the attacks and for dispatching the murderers. This is also a proper moment for an in memoriam. Alberto Nisman of blessed memory was the chief investigator of the 1994 bombings in Buenos Aires. In January of 2015, Nisman was found dead at his home 
one day before he was scheduled to report on his findings with supposedly incriminating evidence against high-ranking officials of the Argentinian government, including former President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner. Nisman's death was initially ruled a suicide, but was later determined to have been a homicide. His story, unfortunately but yet befittingly, is featured now on Netflix, titled Nisman, the Prosecutor, the President, and the Spy. Here is what is clear. Iran is responsible for many terrorist attacks around the world and is continuously financing, training, and arming terrorist organizations. This behavior is nothing new. It did not start yesterday. It's been going on for decades. To shed light on Soleimani's role, and on what is happening in the region, I am pleased to have with us on video from northern Israel, Lieutenant Colonel Reserve Sarit Zahavi, the founder and CEO of ALMA Research and Education Center. Sarit served for 15 years in the Israel Defense Forces. She holds an MA in Middle East Studies from Ben Gurion University in the Negev. She lives with her husband and five children in the northern village of Kfar Vradim, located in the Western Galilee of northern Israel. Zahavi is recognized as a worldwide expert and authority and an impactful speaker on various security issues Israel faces today and doing so right from the border. Sarit, thank you so much for being with us all the way from northern Israel. Thank you very much, Yaha. Maybe uh, we can start off by introducing you to our audience. Tell us a little bit about yourself um, and ALMA. What is the ALMA Educational Center that you head? First of all, the name. I named ALMA after my daughter. She was born at the same time uh, when I left the army. Uh, I was discharged five years ago. I knew that what I wanted to, to do is uh, to continue to brief uh, groups and delegations on the northern border of Israel. And in a gradual process, I established a nonprofit organization because I understood first that in order to speak to groups, we must have a viable uh, research department that can produce visual materials and can gather the information from uh, the websites and social media in Arabic. And that way, we become experts to what is actually what, what we are actually speaking about. Uh, and second, because uh, we understood that it's not enough just to have one woman show. Alma must be an organization with more speakers because there is a great thirst from people outside of Israel to learn, uh, if I can put it this way, the unknown secrets of the northern border. I, I have to say I, that a... Um... I love the phrase, a one-woman show, as well, one-man show, and that in itself, I think, says a lot about <laughs> you. How, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your army service, and how was it like to serve uh, in the um, uh, IDF as a woman and in such a, an important position? Wow. Uh, I must say that uh, I never uh, had any discrimination against or anything like that as a woman in the army, though I was surrounded by men. Uh, the only difficulty was a very personal difficulty, meaning to be a mother and at the same time have a military career, meaning that I was uh, long hours outside of home. But uh, other than that, I received the same opportunity as men. And that is Israel for you. Um, now, maybe to touch a little bit about the topic, can you tell us a little bit about Qasem Soleimani? Who exactly was he? What was his role? <laughs> Qasem Soleimani is the architect of exporting the Islamic revolution outside of Iran. Uh, in order to do that, he established uh, the Iranian proxies in Iraq, in Yemen, in Syria, and in Lebanon. He is the one who is training them, he is the one who is arming them, and he is the one who is using them and commanding them in their uh, battles against their own co uh, communities and their own societies in these countries. Uh, Qasem Soleimani is very, was very close to the Iranian uh, supreme leader. Uh, he received orders directly from Khamenei, from the supreme leader of Iran, uh, which means that he represents uh, the Iranian revolution uh, ideology and strategy in the Middle East. 
And do you, there has been an ongoing debate about uh, whether taking him out was a, a good thing in general or whether it's an appropriate thing to do at the moment. What is your view on the matter? What do you think about um, the move that the United States took and especially at this time? You know, today I met a group of Americans that asked me almost the same question. They asked me whether in the past week I feel safer or less safe since the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. And you know, from the point of view of Israel, uh, of Israelis, okay, killing Qasem Soleimani was an obligation. Uh, it was something that was that must have been done because this man was dangerous and this man was building. Uh, the Shiite terror uh, of Iran, uh, in opposed, if you like, to the Sunni terror of ISIS that was already losing in the battlefield in Syria, this guy was promoting the Shiite terrorism of Iran. And that's why uh, the, the fact he was assassinated uh, will, on the one hand, cause a lot of damage to this project of uh, the Iranian proxies that are threatening the security of Israel and the societies in these countries, in the Middle East, uh, but also delivers a very strong message to Iran that it cannot just do whatever it wants in the Middle East. And that's why it was important. Though all of us Israelis understand that there were a lot of risks in taking uh, off uh, Qasem Soleimani. But the truth is that uh, it goes uh, far beyond Israel. His impact was felt regionally um, through through the proxies, as you say. So at the end of the day, removing him, if I understand you correctly, was a good thing uh, regionally. And the, and the question becomes, many people would say not everybody, I mean, ev anybody can be replaced. Can Soleimani be replaced? Is he a replaceable terrorist? What's your take on this issue? <clears throat> everybody can be replaced. Of course, we've seen this in the past as well, but it will take time. Uh, his deputy is uh, a person that was his deputy for many years. So uh, it will take him time to replace uh, Qasem Soleimani with his reputation and his position over here in the Middle East. And in this time, you actually gain the weakening of these uh, militias. And again, the most important thing is in the psychological level, meaning that the, uh, this uh, uh, action delivered a strong message to the Iranians. Right. And you mentioned something before. You spoke about Shiite terror and Sunni terror. Maybe you can take a minute to explain to our viewers what, is there a difference? You know what? There is a difference. Uh, first, both of them are radical uh, Muslims, okay? Uh, both of them uh, interpret Islam in a very radical uh, way, in, in a way that is very violent. But uh, there are a lot of differences in what they desire to do and how exactly to do that. Uh, and I can say that uh, both of them want, want, want to spread Islam. ISIS and Al-Qaeda uh, are coming from the Sunni side, from uh, ideologies that says that uh, everybody should go back to the original Islam as it was at the times of Muhammad, uh, while the Iranians view themselves as Persians, as superior to all others. They believe that uh, descendants of Muhammad should be those uh, who will lead uh, the Muslim community, that the Shiites are the one who should take the lead in the Muslim community, that there is no difference between the uh, uh, religious cleric and the political leader, it should be the same person. That's why in Iran, the supreme leader, he, who is the one who is taking the lead and not exactly the president, the elected, the allegedly elected president. Right. And bottom line is the difference between Shia terrorism and Sunni terrorism, I must say, that the Shiites are much more, much more sophisticated in a sense, and you described it excellently uh, with all these terrorist attacks that you're opening, uh, they never claim responsibility to most of these attacks. Uh, they use proxies, they don't use their own blood, uh, sacrifice their own blood, so they are much more sophisticated. Yeah. If we could ever um, allocate negativity to the word sophistication. And maybe lastly, um, you mentioned it several times in your talk, the proxies, the militias. 
Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, maybe elaborate a little bit about these proxies. What was the modus operandi of Soleimani and, and the Iranian regime using these proxies? How do they do it and who are they? <clears throat> well, the proxies can come from uh, various nationalities, either Iraqis, Syrians themselves that were given better benefits than uh, what the Syrian army could give them uh, or better conditions, uh, uh, Afghanis and Pakistani that are not exactly pure mercenaries. They were also motivated by ideology. Sometimes uh, the Iranians offered them to uh, settle their families in areas uh, in Syria that were abandoned by the original uh, population there. Uh, in Iraq, their involvement is almost natural since the majority of the people in Iraq are Shiites. But today, the Shiites in Iraq are protesting against these militias. And I want to focus for a moment on Hezbollah, the Lebanese Hezbollah, uh, which is the biggest success of Iranian proxy in the region, uh, getting, becoming not only a militia, but also a political party and a social movement in a way that enables it to gain the control not only on the Shiite population of Lebanon, but also on the systems of the state uh, in Lebanon. Sarit, I can't thank you enough for enlightening us with your analysis, and especially doing so from northern Israel. In this time of much confusion, a clear voice is a true gem and asset. Thank you so much for joining us, and we hope to hear much more of you and from you. Thank you very much, Sarit. Thank you very much, Yaha. As you heard from Sarit and before, we have heard the name Hezbollah all too often. Iran's work through proxies goes far beyond the Middle East. I'm honored to welcome a very special guest from Israel today to the show, Ambassador Daniel Carmon, a veteran of Israel's Misrad Achutz Foreign Ministry, who has just retired from the Foreign Service after an astounding 45-year-long career. Ambassador Carmon joined Israel's Foreign Ministry in 1973 and first served at the Israeli Embassy in Washington, D.C., where he was a member of the Israeli delegation to the Camp David Peace Talks. From 89 to 95, Ambassador Carmon served at the Israeli Embassy in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Between 2005 and 2010, he served as Ambassador and Deputy Permanent Representative at the Israeli Mission to the United Nations in New York. After serving in various diplomatic capacities within the Foreign Ministry, as well as being awarded in 2013 the highest award of excellence of Israel's public service, he assumed position as Ambassador of Israel to India and Sri Lanka, a position he held between 2014 and 2018. Ambassador Carmon has six children, Ariel, Maya, Ofer, Ruthie, Ayala, and Emma. He is accompanied by Ms. Dietze Freum. Ambassador Carmon, thank you very much for joining us all the way from Israel on JBS. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. I, uh, I'd like to begin by maybe if you'd be willing to share with us a little bit of your story as we've heard your incredible career and also of your service in Buenos Aires in the years when two terrible attacks took place, which even cost you a tragic, significant loss of your own. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm looking back at uh, the 45 years in which I served uh, the country uh, in Israel and abroad in as part of the foreign ministry. And uh, I can look back uh, with a lot of satisfaction to a very fascinating career. But there is no doubt that a low, uh, a tragic low in this uh, career was the fact that uh, my professional and my personal stories were intertwined in uh, a very tragic day on the 17th of March, 1992, in which... Uh, Iran, through the Hezbollah, and some local uh, assistance uh, by Argentinians, um, blew up, attacked, blew up the embassy of Israel, destroyed the embassy of Israel in Buenos Aires through what uh, was uh, one of the biggest uh, terrorist attacks uh, against Israel abroad. 
and definitely the biggest terrorist attack at the time in Argentina. And yes, uh, it was a tragedy, a personal tragedy for so many people who lost their lives and their families and the wounded and people that bear scars uh, until, until today. And on a personal side, yes, I lost my wife, the mother of my five children, Eliora Zichona Libracha. Zichona Libracha. Were you, um, were you the embassy that day, Ambassador Carmon? I was at the embassy on that day, on that hour, uh, 2.45 p.m. I was going over uh, some bills with the architect of renovations that we held at the embassy at the time. Luckily, I did not uh, go to where we were supposed to go because I was held up going through the bills with our accountant. If I would have gone to where I was supposed to be at the time, probably we wouldn't be talking now. Wow. Uh, yes, I was at the embassy. I got uh, hit. Uh, I lost uh, my I lost sight for a few days. I lost conscience for a few days. But what is that compared to what happened to other people? Yeah. Can you, um, where was Eliora of blessed memory at the time? She was, was she working at the embassy? She was working at the embassy in the communication sector of the embassy, which was in the second floor or the third floor, sorry. And she was specifically on the second floor. She was going back to her office when uh, the bomb uh, exploded and, as I said before, destroyed more than half of the embassy. Right. And uh, she was uh, for a uh, few uh, hours until her body was found. She was under the rubble, uh, practically. And this is a, a diplomatic reality, that the, um, you go out on a diplomatic mission, Shlichut, and your family goes with you, and that's living on the front line, isn't it, Ambassador Carmon? Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, it's... It, it's uh, when, when you join the diplomatic service, uh, the Israeli diplomatic service, there's no doubt that uh, you are on a mission, you do a job, you try to do a profession as good as you can, but there is one element that people forget or maybe don't even know. Uh, being a diplomat is a way of life. You uh, do not go uh, to a nine to five or nine to six um, a job uh, you take your family with you back and forth uh, from Israel to other places and back home. And the Israeli diplomats for so many years and until today have to confront not only diplomatic uh, challenges, not only the challenges of being abroad, uh, making new acquaintances and friends and departing and, and connecting, but we also have to be very minded to the security situation. Right. And yes, as a way of life, you take your family with you to the front line. And Buenos Aires, unfortunately, was the front line. You know, um, to this we say thank you for your service. And this is a very important point for people to understand the incredible service that's being done by diplomats everywhere, and as by Israeli diplomats especially, and the kind of risks that are taken um, while taking those missions on. And um, for the general public to understand what that entails. I'd like to ask you now, um, what do you remember of Israel's response to the attack in Buenos Aires? How quickly did the IDF arrive at the scene? Can you describe what happened? Uh, we are talking, uh, when talking about uh, terrorist attacks by Iran through Hezbollah, uh, in, with the very similar um, parameters of the attacks, there was two and a half Years later, there was an attack against the Jewish community center, Amya, uh, in which, again, uh, the building of the Jewish community uh, in the, the center of the Jewish community in Buenos Aires was blown up, totally blown up, with uh, 85 people killed. Uh, a few hours later, there was a decision taken by the Israeli government to send a contingent of the IDF search and rescue uh, and a medical unit. And after, I suppose, 90 hours, 
IDF was there and started uh, searching and trying to rescue people from under the rubble. But this is the second attack uh, by Hezbollah and by Iran on Argentinian soil. I'd like to ask you, um, with everything that's been going on, Hezbollah still seems to be running at large. Do you feel the international community has made any strides in putting a stop to this Iranian proxy from running amok all over the world and uh, f devastating embassies and, and, and civilian institutions and killing people? Well, you know, we have Hezbollah on our front, uh, on our borders, on our northern border, as uh, a, an organization that is actually occupying uh, the country of Lebanon. Uh, but we also have Hezbollah as a proxy uh, of, uh, of Iran. And there are so many examples of attack throughout the world by Hezbollah. Uh, attacks in Beirut also. There were hundreds of uh, American Marines and French soldiers killed in the 80s. I can give you a whole list of uh, attacks uh, perpetrated by uh, Hezbollah throughout uh, the, the years. Uh, we start uh, seeing in the last few years some uh, change in the attitude of the international community towards Hezbollah with uh, some countries uh, uh, designating Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. That's a political challenge. Uh, it's a slow process. Uh, only yesterday we heard that Honduras uh, decided to designate Hezbollah as a terrorist organization, but it's yeah. tough. It's a tough. It's a tough process, a tough issue, a very politicized issue, uh, and unfortunately not not uh, enough countries have designated uh, yet the Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. I hope more countries will join uh, the U.S. and uh, Israel and some European countries and Canada and Australia uh, in, uh, and, and, of course, uh, Honduras and Argentina, by the way, uh, uh, recognizing and designating Hezbollah as a terrorist organization. Oh. Well, um, it's excellent to see the kind of work that you've done. And I have to end with one of my personal favorites, one of Israel's best kept secrets. In one of your numerous positions you held within the Israeli Foreign Ministry, you also headed Mashav, Israel's Center for International Cooperation, the development agency, um, which is an incredible operation of Israel and Israel's foreign ministry that not enough people know about. Can you, is there anything you want to share about that experience? Uh, sure. Uh, I, uh, before going to uh, India, I did head uh, Mashav, which is the Israeli Agency for International Development Cooperation. Uh, this is an agency, part of the foreign ministry, part of Israel's diplomacy. Uh, this is what we call development diplomacy in which Israel shares its uh, innovation, its uh, technology, its uh, know-how in various fields uh, like agriculture and uh, water and entrepreneurship uh, with the developing uh, world in something that is very Jewish. It's what part of what we call the Olam, Correct, yeah. but it's also part of our Israeli diplomacy. You know, there, I, I don't think there is a better point to end our conversation, Ambassador Carmon, who, for the incredible service that you provided through your diplomatic career, not only to the Jewish people in the state of Israel, but through Mashav and elsewhere to the rest of the world in standing up for what's right, which is truly, truly inspirational. Thank you so much for taking the time and being with us, Ambassador Carmon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Saha, for your kind words. And uh, God bless you. Thank you. Hear you more on JBS. Thank you, Ambassador Carmon. And those are the thoughts of Sarit Zahavi from Northern Israel and Ambassador Daniel Carmon. The incredible stories of Israel and of the world. Food for your own thoughts as we all navigate in this complicated world of ours. I'd like to thank our director, Sloan Copeland, JBS's managing director, Dara Golub, Technical Manager Michael Paley, Transmission Manager John McDevitt, and to the producer of In the News, Carol Lilienthal. For JBS, I'm Shahar Razani. Until next time, Lehit Raot, and see you soon.
we would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more. Simply visit the JBS website at jbstv.org and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check to JBS, P.O. Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.